Well, welcome to Heavenly Hawaiian Farms. We are a 38-acre farm with over 20,000 coffee trees on this farm. Our coffee uh, trees produce about 8,500 pounds of cherry, the fruit with the two coffee beans inside uh, per acre. That works out to roughly 15 to 16 pounds of coffee uh, per tree. We've taken that roasted coffee bean and ground it to a medium grind. You use medium grind for a percolator or a coffee maker like you see behind us here. Mr. Coffee, that works fine. Krups works great. Cuisinart, they work great too. For a coffee uh, maker such as this, we medium grind the coffee. You fine grind coffee for an espresso and you coarse grind the coffee for a French press. And the reason is you don't want to have too fine of a grind with your coffee maker because otherwise you're going to be extracting a lot more acid. Remember we talked about oils and acids and the importance of oil over acids, oil overcoming the natural acidity. So we do a medium grind. Most of the coffees in Kona don't come up to snuff. There's maybe 20% of us that can produce what I would say demonstrates the ideal mellow flavor of a uh, Kona coffee. First thing we will do is we're going to nose the coffee. And so you, just like wine tasting, now the young one here is probably a little too young to have tasted wine, but... She's Catholic. She's, had she's a Catholic. <laughs> so she, she has tasted wine. Okay, very good. Uh, we're Catholic also, so fully understand. <laughs> All right, so let's do the nose. So just get a, get an impression, mental impression, and just kind of blurt out what you, you kind of, you, you smell here. What, what's, what kind of smell do you get? What kind of nose, as we say in the business, do you get? I smell smooth. Smooth. You get a little butter, a little buttery, maybe a little chocolate, maybe a little bit of nut. Did you say nuts? Nuts. I get a lot of nuts. Our coffee seems to demonstrate with nuts, butter, smooth. That's coming from the oils now. And then once in a while we get a chocolatey nose on it, um, but mostly butter and, uh, and, and nuts. It's pretty common. So that's a pleasant. So you would score, let me help you out here, an 11 on a scale. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Bad coffees are very acidic. All coffees have acidity, but the key is to grow coffee that shows very little acidity. And we're going to slurp it to the back of the tongue because we want to bypass all those other those other sensors. So we're going to take it and we're going to make a lot of noise, folks. Wow. Is this got a decent, a good coffee flavor? Or do you pick up tastes like, believe it or not, I have cup coffee that tastes like gasoline, kerosene, etc. Really? Co co coffee, as I explained to these gentlemen earlier, when on the tour, coffee is absorptive. It will pick up moisture. So that's why it's tough to dry on the floor here, up and down in moisture. You're trying to get it down to about 11% moisture content. It will also pick up smells and tastes. So if you store coffee in a garage or a barn with diesel fuel, guess, guess what? If you store it under the house on the dirt, guess what? It's going to taste, it's going to taste like dirt. So, so you're looking for any off taste. This is pretty clean, I think. Okay, so you're going to give this a 12. No, I'm just kidding. In the wine business, we swirl the cup. That's called hanging the oil on the side of the glass. Yes, we You're do. hanging the oil. <laughs> yes, yeah. we do. <laughs> and how has that worked out for you? <laughs> okay. So we're doing the same thing, except we aren't going to swirl the cup. We're going to use the tongue to determine. And that's called texture. So again, you slurp it, and then now you're looking for body. Is it syrupy or is it washed out? Mm -hmm. What did you just do? In I slurped it to the back of the tongue. Okay. okay. See the difference in that? Interesting. Rather than just drinking coffee like right. we all do. Right. See the difference when you slurp it to the back? So when you're buying coffee, that's what you can do. What would your describing words be for texture? Okay. Are you talking about weight? Like it's density? Called, it's or are you called talking density. About? Okay. Thickness. Syrup. Okay. Is it syrupy? Is it washed out? Is it watery? Thin. 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 Exactly. Okay. Okay. This is what makes Kona, Kona. This is why we're the number one most sought after coffee in the world. Why? Because the coffee is supposed to be mellow. Balanced, smooth was a term that you used. And that's what we're looking for. And your tongue salivary glands are starting to go, mine are, saying, I like it. I like it. That's always a good indicator. If you can get the salivary glands moving, uh, you've got whatever you're eating or drinking, it's good. And I kind of look at this as like a coffee malt. And the important thing about not being acidic, guess what? You guys feel any upset in your tummy? No. Nope. No. 
You don't either, do you? Okay. <laughs> That's because the coffee is smooth. It's mellow. It's bad. But the final thing is really what's the aftertaste? No, ours is pretty good. Yeah. And it's pleasant. And that's why I can drink 20 cups of coffee a day. <laughs> <laughs> I try to limit myself to five. I've been known to drink as many as ten. This is what a good Kona cup should taste like with those those attributes that we just did. All right. So Cheers. there's your Cheers. quick lesson on right. coffee. Okay. Off camera. Coffee right. uh, starts flowering in January and February. After every heavy rain, you get a white flowering, and that white flowering is called Kona snow. It'll light up the whole farm. It looks like snow. And then after the next rain, we'll have more flowering. That could be a week or two weeks later. Well, why is Kona number one in the world? We are number one in the world in terms of demand. And the reason for that is that we produce a relatively smooth, mild, balanced, mellow cup of coffee. And for the uh, agronomists and for the botanists, I can tell you what I have figured out that to be a cause of, and that is caused by oil production. To be a good coffee, you've got to maximize oil production. Well, Kona, a good Kona cup, and mm -hmm. I can tell you, not everybody produces, mm -hmm. like what we do on mm -hmm. this farm, uh, produces a, a coffee with a profile that shows a lot of oil that overcomes the natural acidity. What does it take to make a, an award-winning uh, Kona cup? There's four ingredients. Number one, you've got to have good soils. So you've got to have a nice volcanic soil. Volcanic soils are good, too, because they're loaded with minerals. And you get phosphorus, potassium, etc. And the uh, natural pH of, a, of an acidic, of a, uh, of a volcanic soil, uh, the acidity is about 6.5. And these trees are okay with a little bit of acidity in the, in the soil. Number two, and I think most importantly, is rain or irrigation. And that's uh, 50 to 80, some say 60 to 80 inches of rain for these high elevation Arabicas. Number three is how, what are your best farming practices? How do you feed the trees? How do you uh, sucker them? Those are all important parts of it. You have to make sure there's plenty of um, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen for the green leaves, phosphorus for the root structure, and potassium for the beans. The other, the third way is to block cut. They mm -hmm. will block cut five acres at a time. Go through and just whack all the trees, and then after a year, uh, comes back and then the second year starts producing coffee. So for Kona, uh, the maximum uh, production typically, all of Kona, 900 farms, 5,000 acres is about 3 million pounds of green bean hmm. per year. We do 40,000 give or take. We're about 1.5% of the world market. Huh. At the south end of this island, we have another origin. Remember, this is Kona is an origin. It's the same thing as an Appalachian or Terrar for wines. We call it origin. At the south end of this island, we have the Ka'u origin, and it's a little different, same trees, but the flavor's a little bit different. It's a little more robust, and some of the body is a little heavier than ours. They really do produce good quality uh, oils in their coffees. In fact, I have to say that Ka'u has occasionally um, beat us in our own cupping competition, so <laughs> congratulations to them. We're trying to help them get their industry going. We do 3 million pounds of green. They do about 10% of that, about 300,000 pounds of green. We've been at it 175 years. Kau has been at it about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they're finally coming on, and we really uh, we applaud them for what they're doing. You can see here that we have verticals. We've got three or four verticals off of each stump. And we get about three years' use out of a vertical. And the um, coffee grows on the horizontal. It grows on the horizontal. Um, we get about 15 pounds per uh, per year. It starts out as a flower, goes to a bud, green cherry, yellow cherry, orange cherry like you can see, and then a, a red cherry. These that are turning red right now were flowers, white flowers, about uh, seven, six and a half, seven months ago. So coffee grows on the horizontal. It typically grows only once in a given area, and then next year we'll have growth, maybe a little bit of overlap out here, and then finally out at the end. And after three years, the cherry is growing so far out the limb that it takes the nutrients a long way to get to it. And the quality, I believe, drops a little bit and the quantity certainly drops off. So that's when we whack the verticals off at the stump. And then we get new kikis, which is Hawaiian word for child or for um, offshoot growing. And those down there will be producing coffee in about a year.
Is there ever an issue with labor shortages too? Or? Yeah, uh, we we use uh, local pickers, and then we fly pickers in from Los Angeles. We have one picker in from Alaska. They love picking this farm because it's so clean and oh, yeah. got grass and it's like carpet. Mm -hmm. So we we don't have any problem getting pickers, but other farms that are on a lot of rock and whatever oh, yeah. uh, pickers kind of shy away from that. So picking pick good pickers are a premium. They're they're sought after and extremely well respected mm -hmm. I tell you that's it's not easy but they enjoy what they're doing and they're very adept a good picker again will do 200 250 pounds a day wow. good survivors and good producers on what we do uh, with the red cherry once we pick it we bring it in here we weigh it in on this scale so each picker gets a credit for how many pounds they pick that day after the coffee comes off the scale the bags of coffee are then stacked up around this part of the wet mill. This whole thing is a wet mill. And this is the hopper where we drop the red cherry um, in to be processed. This, this is a hand auger. So what we do is if we hand auger the coffee into a sump pump, and this line right here is a water line. It's connected to that pipe coming out of the sump pump. And this pumps coffee, water, and rocks, unfortunately, into the de-stoner. That's a rock catcher. And you can see the outline of the bins inside. Rocks will sink to the bottom and we pull them out at the end of the day after we're done processing. But we pop the, uh, the beans out of the red cherry because that's real slimy mucilage around the uh, parchment uh, underneath the skin. And if you squeeze it, beans go flying. Same idea here except they go flying downward. They squeeze up against the breastplate They'll carry the, the cherry up against the breastplate and pop the beans out literally and they come out through three holes into this auger and the auger moves the coffee in this direction into what is called the cribba. And the cribba is sized about 24 64 of an inch and it will accept only properly skinned cherry. The cherry that's not skinned goes into a tub, gets recycled. The beans that are properly skinned will fit through this cribba and drop to this auger underneath and coffee uh, parchment with the slimy mucilage on it is moved this way with another auger to the back of this device which is called a uh, this is called a demucilager you're taking the mucilage the slimy sugary covering off of the off of the, uh, the parchment we're using water to actually pull the sugary covering off of the coffee bean. There's three ways to process coffee. This is called a washed coffee. You can have a honey coffee where you take the skin off but let the bean dry, let the bean dry in the parchment and the honey sugar adds a little bit and then you can have a totally natural and that's where the coffee cherry is dried without running through any of this. You just dry it on the floor and that's called natural dried. And there's markets for all three of those. But 95% of the coffees in the world are what we call washed coffees, the process that we, we use here. And then the squeaky clean parchment comes through here, the tube. Uh, these are washing squirts. This is my invention. It's a high-pressure manifold to really super clean the beans. They come out through here, and then we'll have one of our carts, like over here, stainless steel carts, sitting underneath here to catch the beans. So the ratio is from red cherry to wet parchment. We take the outer skins off and we're down to the, we take the mucilage off, right? We're down to parchment now. So the ratio of weight between the red cherry that went into that hopper behind you and into the mill and the parchment you see on the floor is roughly uh, 21 20, uh, 21 to 20 percent, something like that. And when you take the uh, when you take the parchment skin off of this, then you will actually be down to about 18 percent. So the ratio between red cherry and green bean is 18 percent. So okay. So then, and this is as far as we take the coffee on this farm. This is to this is a wet mill. We take it to the parchment stage. The next stage is a dry mill. We take this parchment to a dry mill and they have expensive equipment, a lot of manpower, to take the outer skin off, this parchment skin, like that, 
take off the mucilage, which is, whoops, we just lost our bean. Well, <laughs> let's go find another one here. Here we go. So, yeah, there's a parchment skin underneath, and then underneath the parchment skin is a silver skin, and you rub the silver skin off, and underneath that is the coffee bean. So the dry mill does that function. It, it takes this skin off, takes that skin off, and then buffs up, polishes the green bean, uh, getting ready uh, to go into, into the bags. Now, 5% uh, of our total production is a pea berry. The way these coffee beans stack up inside a red cherry that you just took a look at up on the tree is like this. Okay, they're stacked like that. Okay, but if only one of those germinates, and that's 5% of our total production, it germinates just one, it will not stay in a flat mode. It will move into a rounded pea berry mode. Aha! I think we got lucky, folks. Mm -hmm. Here we are. 5% of our total production. That's a pea berry. And that's, this is a type 2 bean right here. This is a type 1 bean. So this one converts into that. And what happens is this fills the space that was destined for two of these larger beans and it gets all the nutrients and therefore it's going to get a little bit more oil, be a little bit more oily and also have a little bit better flavor because it's going to have more of the natural oils uh, produced, um, all concentrated in a smaller bean. That's why pea berry is the connoisseur's quintessential bean and that's why it sells for a little bit more per pound than just these uh, type 1 beans. Type 1 bean, type 2 bean. Heavenly Hawaiian Farms shoots for about 11 to 11.5 percent. We've got to be below 12, but I like to have a little bit more water in the bean because it's going to help pull the oils to the surface when we go through the roasting uh, process. So, I don't have five to ten days to dry because where our decks would have to be two to three times what they are right now because of all the coffee we produce. So instead of doing that, we dry coffee mechanically. These are mechanical dryers. So sun dry, mechanically dry. The question is, do you have enough space to dry it? If you don't, you need to have mechanical dryers. And there are different kinds of dryers. These are the most common you'll find in Kona. These are tumblers. And these will hold uh, about 1,700 pounds of, of drying parchment each. So I can dry about 5,000 pounds of coffee a day through here. You might be asking, well, how do you know when you've hit that magic 11 or 11.5% 11 moisture content? We have two devices that we use. These are moisture meters. This one is called a Dickey John, and it's used for many kinds of crops around the country. Coffee is number 12, so there's a chip in here for coffee. So what we do is we drop the parchment into this device, it's on a spring, and the machine will measure the weight versus conductivity. And from that it will calculate the moisture content, and after you push all the buttons and do all the good things, you're going to get a digital readout right here. We are now at the vault for our coffee. This is where we store our parchment and our finished green bean after it's been fully processed at the dry mill. Uh, we store at 65 degrees Fahrenheit and 65% humidity. With that, we can store parchment for up to two years and green bean for up to one year with very little degradation in quality. But before we enter, I want to talk a little bit about the designs and the logos for our, for our farm here. When I bought the farm about 12 years ago, Trudy and I bought, this was the design that we had. That was Heavenly Hawaiian Farms, and I thought that was cool. But I kept looking for Juan Valdez to jump out of the cup there behind the donkey, and no, he never came. So I redesigned it into what I thought might be a little bit more heavenly. And so we brought in the angelic figure with a haka or a halo, and roasting, throwing roasted coffee down with your hands. And you'll see the, the roasted, the red cherry that you saw on the flowers that you did not see, but flowers end up seven months into the red and then the leaves. So that makes a nice uh, aggregation of color and that's the new design. That's what is being now recognized around the world. We'll show you what we did uh, with the labels. Very colorful. We've actually won some awards for this design. We're now going to enter one of our two vaults uh, where we store the coffee. So come in here, join me. Ah, it feels nice and cool. Oh, wow. This is always my favorite part of the 
of the tour. We get to cool down. <laughs> um, it's pretty nice air conditioned. It smells good too. <laughs> smells very good. That's coffee you smell. Yeah. But not roasted, you're smelling the green. This is parchment. That's what you saw up on the, on the deck. And this is how far we take it on this farm with the wet mill. Remember, there's a parchment skin and there's a silver skin and inside is the coffee bean. So we'll take 500 bags, let's say every year, um, down to the dry mill. 500 bags will fill this room. Fill this room right to the door. Can't get another bag in here. And that we will load up in our trucks and take down to the mill. We will then take the coffee and run it through a huller or a husker. And the purpose of that is to take these skins off all the way down to the green bean. And when we get down to the green bean, it will look something like this. This is a green bean that has been actually processed at the dry mill and graded by the state. This is the state uh, sample from last year. Coffee that we'll show you in a bag here. So we go from this state right here to this state. And that you can see the skins are off. And this is coffee. This is called green bean. This is parchment. This is green bean. And this green bean is now ready for roasting. And this is what we ship around the world. So let's go take a look at a coffee bag that actually has this same green bean in it. And these bags over here um, have been graded and certified by the state. The mill puts these two certificate, these two designations on, the origin, Kona, and the grade, 19 screen, 1964 of an inch beans or bigger, and Kona Prime, that's the grade. The state will take a sample, the one that I had in my hand there, about three pounds, and actually put it under a magnifying glass and start counting beans, counting defects. And assuming defects do not exceed 20% by weight, 100 pound sack, I can have 20 pounds of coffee beans that have little pinholes in them or whatever that don't affect flavor, but are considered to be a cosmetic defect. As long as I don't exceed 20% by weight, I do get the Kona grade. So I am now uh, approved with this official certificate, the stamp, and a piece of paper that comes with it, a certificate as to origin and quality, which is grade, that I use as part of my international shipping document package when we ship coffees around the world. And again, this is what this is exactly what we ship around the world and we use. This coffee here is for my guests um, who do the tours here at the farm. We do many, many tours a day. And also we use this to roast for our online customers. So again, here is there is the coffee bean. Get the light microphone. There's the coffee bean. And this is what we're shipping around the world, 100 pound sacks. Welcome now to our roasting room. We do a little bit of roasting on this uh, roaster. This is a five kilo roaster. It was designed in Korea. It's a uh, brand new technology, it uses infrared uh, technology. But because we do so much roasting on this farm, I use a neighbor who will roast 30 to 40 pounds a day for us, but I can do five kilos on this. Wow. This is what a small roaster looks like. Now, you remember the green bean that you saw down there? And if you remember, it looked like that. Mm -hmm. That's pre-roasted. And when you roast it at 440 degrees Fahrenheit, this is what you get. Look at the size of these beans. These are a good one-third larger than the original green bean. And that's because they puff up. They puff up a little bit. There's a million microcells in a coffee bean. And this is what you want. So this is coffee that has been, this is a medium dark roast. We call it a Vienna roast. And it has been roasted at about 440 degrees Fahrenheit on a civets roaster. Every roaster will roast to get the same profile will roast at a different temperature and you also have to take into consideration the elevation of the farm or the roasting operation as well as the humidity and moisture in the air on the outside. Those will all affect your uh, key profile points when you're roasting coffee. It's a very precise science. It's a craft, it's an art, but it too is a science. We've gotten it to where now we can actually quantify on a computer, on a roasting machine, uh, the, the roast points and you roast at certain temperatures through certain times 
to get the desired roasting profile. This is a medium dark roast. We also do a dark roast. And a dark roast will be just a little bit darker. It's browner and it's a little, it's going almost black and it's got more oil to the surface. And this was roasted at about 460 Fahrenheit versus 440 Fahrenheit. Okay. How does one differentiate uh, between uh, the, the bold or like a milder roast? How, how does that come about? Well, you have to know the, you have to know the roaster or at the store. There's no way to know. Yeah. I mean, it'll say medium roast. It'll probably be something similar to what we have here. A dark roast would be something similar to. But most roasts go out a medium dark. That's where ninety five percent of your buying public is. Right. Maybe five ten percent will buy our um, our dark roast. Uh, most of the worldwide coffees uh, are caffeinated at about one hundred and twenty two milligrams per eight ounce cup. Our coffee. Uh, comes out at about 85 milligrams per cup, and then when you de decaffeinate, you're down to two to three milligrams of caffeine left in the in the bean. So we just had the Havenly Hawaiian tour, and we met uh, Dave and Trudy, which are amazing. They gave the most hospitable tour I can imagine. I and it's a free tour. It's a free tour, but we also bought probably like 70 to 80 dollars worth of coffee. So. We're happy about that, but we're we're big on coffee, so yeah. definitely it's fantastic it. coffee. It helps you actually enjoy the experience of drinking a good cup of coffee. What was it like when you actually drank the coffee here? You know, I, I actually, you know, how sometimes uh, coffee can kind of give you a slightly irritated uh, stomach. This was a really uh, what do they call what do they call that a, sm a smooth blend, and it really just really was a good a good experience. It has has a really great uh, flavor to it as well, so. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely mm -hmm. worth buying this coffee.